Rachakamanuyanti balas te mrityoyanti vititasya pasham Atadhira amritatvam viditva dhruvam adhruvesh vihana prartayante The unintelligent people follow the external desires. They get entangled in the snares of the widespread death. Therefore, the discriminating people, having known true immortality in the midst of impermanent things, do not pray for anything here. Now then, the natural tendency to perceive outwardly the things that are not the self is the cause of the obstruction of the vision of the self. And it is ignorance, since it is opposed to that vision. And there is that thirst for the enjoyment of those very outer things, whether seen or unseen, presented by ignorance. Those whose vision of the self is obstructed by those two, ignorance and thirst, those bala children, or men of little intelligence, anuyanti, follow, only parachaha kaman, the external desirable things, te, they, because of that reason, yanti, get entangled in, asham, ropes or snares by which one is bound, consisting in the association with the body, senses, etc., Vitatasya, of that which is vast, spread everywhere. Mrityo, of death, which is ignorance, desire, and action. The meaning is that they are constantly subject to birth, death, old age, disease, and other multifarious evils. Since this is so, Atta, hence, Dhiraha, the discriminating people, Viditva, having known amritvatvam, immortality, which consists in realizing the true state of the indwelling self as the dhruvam, sure thing, for the immortality of the gods and others is unstable. Whereas this immortality, consisting in continuing in the true state of the indwelling self, is stable, as supported by the text it neither increases nor decreases through work. Brihadaranyakopanishad 4.4.23 Having known the constant and unshakable immortality, having ascertained it even adruveshu, amidst all impermanent things, the knowers of Brahman, naprarteyante, do not pray for anything, iha, in this world that is full of evil because all this is opposed to the vision of the innermost self. They inevitably rise above the desires for progeny, wealth, and worlds of enjoyment. Namaste. So this verse and the previous one, verse 1, talk about the obstacles to enlightenment. And the main obstacle to enlightenment is the senses. In the beginning of the creation, the Creator afflicted the senses so that they only point outward into the world of sense objects. And what are the sense objects? Basically, earth, water, air, fire, and space. So these five objects, along with the mind, are the subject matter of everyone's life. And people in general who have no knowledge take them at face value as the reality. But this is very unfortunate because it dooms them to not being able to attain enlightenment or immortality or freedom from suffering. So this chapter is going to discuss in more detail why this is so and how we can get around it. But really, the principle 
is given right there in this second verse, that one has to turn the attention away from the senses within and discover the self. Why do I say discover it? Because it's already there. See, there are two approaches to self-realization. And I would call these roughly the yoga approach and the tantra approach. The yoga approach is by will, by effort. That one follows some program of meditation, one does specific exercises to turn the attention towards the self and realize it. And the problem with this, the difficulty is it requires effort. And effort simply amplifies the ego. In fact, you could say that the ego is effort. So the more efforts one makes, the more one identifies as the doer. I am doing this yogic process to attain my enlightenment. <laughs> See, it's so ridiculous. It's self-defeating. It gives the opposite result. And then one has to counteract that result and so on and so forth. It's an endless regression, huh? Regression ad infinitum. That means if I do this process, then it not only gives a result, but it gives some side effect. Then I have to nullify that side effect, and that is also an effort which creates another side effect, and so on. There's no end to it. But the tantric approach is different. The tantric approach is by insight, not effort, by knowledge, rather than doing, knowing, or seeing. In other words, for example, realizing the self, we already are the self. We're already Brahman. All we have to do is accept that. And then, you know, so many obstacles just fall away, just vanish. And the same with the senses. If the senses become bothersome, distracting, realize that the senses are also Brahman. Not only that, the sense objects are also Brahman, just covered with different upadis. So by seeing through the upadis to the self, in other words, seeing through the imagination or the illusion to the reality, then one acquires the realization immediately, without effort. Well, maybe there's a small effort of learning and becoming convinced of this knowledge. But once you accept this knowledge, and I mean really accept it, not try to see it as an alternative to the uh, consensus view of reality, external reality, but to replace that view with the internal view that everything is the self. That's what the Vedas say, aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman, sarva kalvidang brahma, everything is Brahman, whatever exists. And so here in this uh, tika, there's a nice contrast between the processes that involve this uh, will and action of the senses and the process of insight, that the process of external sacrifice, Vedic sacrifice, according to rules and regulations in the scriptures, basically karma yoga, cannot give lasting, stable enlightenment. And he makes a quote from Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Let's take a look at that quote in full. Yajnavalka said, This is the eternal glory of a knower of Brahman. It neither increases nor decreases through work. 
Therefore, one should know the nature of that alone. Knowing it, one is not touched by evil action. Therefore, he who knows it as such becomes self-controlled, calm, withdrawn into himself, enduring and concentrated, and sees the self in his own self, body and mind. He sees all as the self. Evil does not overtake him, but he transcends all evil. Evil does not trouble him, but he consumes all evil. He becomes sinless, taintless, free from doubts, and a true Brahmana, knower of Brahman. This is the world of Brahman, O Emperor, and you have attained it. Brihadara Nyakopanishad 4, 4, 23. So basically, Brahman does not increase or decrease through work. Work means action of the senses in the world on their objects. So, of course, the standard system of Vedic sacrifice, Agnistoma and so on, Agnihotra and so on, these are all done with the senses using the objects in the world. They're a form of work. So work cannot increase or decrease Brahman. Either pious work or impious work has any effect on it. Brahman is simply there. It's already the self. And working to attain Brahman is kind of an oxymoron. It's kind of a contradiction in terms. Because Brahman does not work, is not a cause of work, is not a result of work, is not the object of work, and can never be any of these things. Because Brahman has no relation to anything else. <laughs> Aham Brahmasmi. See, if we simply accept this as insight, and look at reality with this view, then everything falls into line automatically, effortlessly, and perfectly. But then he goes on and he talks about the knower of Brahman. The knower of Brahman attains immortality effortlessly, without work, and the Nature of his immortality is completely stable. It's called here Dhruvam. Dhruvam, by the way, is the name of the pole star. We call it Polaris in the West, but in India it's called Dhruvam. Why? Because it means that which does not move. The whole heavens revolve around it, and it stays exactly where it is. So this is Dhruvam or Dhruvaloka. So the immortality gained by knowledge and realization of Brahman is Dhruvam. It never changes. Whereas the enlightenment and the liberation, the release by work, by Vedic sacrifice is temporary because one goes to the heavenly planets and then when the results of one's pious activities are exhausted, one falls again back to the earth and has to take a human birth. But that's not true of those who attain enlightenment through knowledge of Brahman. They become Brahman or rather realize they are already Brahman. Right here, right now, in this life, in this body. And then they have no next life. There is no next birth. There is no next world. They are already in the world of Brahman by their very insight, by their very consciousness. Because actually, all consciousness is Brahman. All awareness is Turiya or Turiya Tita. And all beings and all creations is nothing but the Supreme Brahman. Aum Tatsat, 
Aum Shakti Aum Aum Namah Shivaya